Okay, welcome everyone to another day of the second wave of the pandemic, Science and Society. Today, our guest speaker is Dr. Huma Farid, of, uh, an obstetrician and gynecologist at Beth Israel Medical Center and an instructor in obstetrics and gynecology at Harvard Medical School. She will be discussing pregnancy during the pandemic and associated issues concerning pregnancy and COVID-19. Welcome, Dr. Farid. Thank you so much, Dr. Milich, for your lovely introduction and for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, I am an OBGYN at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, and I'm going to be talking to you today about pregnancy and a pandemic, implications of COVID-19 for pregnant patients. I have no financial disclosures. Our objectives today are going to be to describe the physiology of pregnancy, review the transmission, presentation, and mortality rates for SARS-CoV-2, understand the risks of COVID-19 in pregnancy, analyze the psychosocial effects of being pregnant during a pandemic, and then some hope, looking forward to the future. So I'm gonna just briefly review the physiology of pregnancy and I'll highlight a couple of the most important things that I want you to remember because they're going to play a part in how this disease impacts pregnancy. So first, really back to basics. So every month, a woman ovulates if she's not on birth control and an egg is released from the ovary. If a patient has had sex around the time of ovulation, there is a possibility of sperm fertilizing that egg. And once that egg is fertilized, it becomes an embryo. It travels down through the fallopian tube and it starts replicating. And as it implants into the uterus, where it will eventually grow into a fetus, um, the, those first cells are becoming a placenta. This is, and I probably should have warned you, it's a little, this is the only graphic picture, but this is the side of the placenta that faces the uterus. So it faces the mom. Um, and this is the side of the placenta that the baby is encapsulated in. And so this shiny membrane here is the amniotic membrane or the bag of water. This is obviously the umbilical cord. And the placenta is this really incredible organ. It starts off from just a few cells. And by the end of a full-term pregnancy, it weighs about a pound. And it serves two purposes. One is that it provides nutrients from mom's blood and transmits them to the baby. And the second is that it takes all the waste that that fetus is excreting and eliminates that waste so that waste products do not build up in the amniotic fluid. So I think of it as a really good regulator. It's like a two-way street and the placenta is really good at its job of providing nutrients to the growing fetus and eliminating the waste products. While the placenta is growing, so is the uterus. The uterus grows 500 to 1,000 times greater in pregnancy. So it starts off you know, in pre-pregnancy, probably like the size of my fist or a little bit smaller, and it starts rapidly growing to accommodate a growing baby. And by the end of a full-term pregnancy, the uterus is so big that it reaches the liver. Sounds pretty comfortable, right? Um, and the uterus grows not by adding in new myocytes, which are the muscle cells that make up the uterus, but rather those cells stretch and elongate. But they are incredible at what they do. There's a couple of key physiologic changes in pregnancy uh, driven a little bit by the uterus uh, that I want to talk to you about. The first is the blood. The blood volume nearly doubles for a pregnant patient. And there's a couple of reasons uh, behind that increase. The first is that if you can imagine as the uterus is growing, it requires a lot of blood flow to sustain it and to bring all those nutrients and that oxygen to help grow. So the uterus is directly driving that increase in blood. The second reason is that pregnancy and delivery in particular, it's quite bloody. You lose a lot of blood when you deliver, whether that's through a C-section or a vaginal delivery. And so to offset that expected blood loss during delivery, the body starts to make more blood volume so that even if you lose you know, 500 cc's or so, you will have enough blood to continue to survive. And so it's a survival mechanism. Although the blood volume nearly doubles, the red blood cells, which uh, make up you know, carry oxygen, they don't increase as much as the blood volume. And so pregnant women tend to be slightly anemic because while they have a lot of blood volume, they don't have as many red blood cells to compensate. The second system that changes during pregnancy is the immune system. So in pregnancy, T cells, which are part of the immune system, they're cells that, um, that you know, detect foreign bodies, those are suppressed. 
Interestingly though, antibody levels tend to be higher in pregnancy, meaning that if a pregnant woman has had an infection previously, she's made antibodies and those antibody levels are higher and are more efficient at fighting off that repeat infection. And the third physiologic change that's pretty uh, key and pretty extraordinary is that of the cardiopulmonary system, so the heart and lungs. For the heart, the cardiac output, meaning the amount of blood that is pumped through the heart, increases for a pregnant patient. And if you can imagine, part of it is that that blood volume has increased, so there's more blood to be pumped. And so the heart has to work a little bit harder and a little bit faster to pump all of that blood through. And the second reason is this uterus again, right? Like you can imagine that rapidly growing uterus, it requires a lot of blood flow. And at full term, the uterus is taking about 30% of the blood flow to sustain the uterus. Uh, heart rate often increases for pregnant patients. So I have patients saying, oh, it feels like my heart is racing constantly. And that's partly because the heart is beating faster. Interestingly, as the uterus is growing, it's growing really, really big and it's squishing the lungs. And so pregnant women often talk about their, you know, feeling short of breath, not being able to uh, feel like they can take a deep breath. And that's partly because the uterus has grown so big that it's squishing that normal lung volume. So normally those lungs would be bigger in a non-pregnant patient. And because the uterus is so big, it's squishing the lungs and they're not able to take a deep breath they, and they feel short of breath. This is actually important for respiratory illnesses in particular. And of course, SARS-CoV-2 causes a respiratory illness. And so if you can imagine having less lung volume predisposes you to having more severe respiratory infections. So, and we'll come back to that. So let's talk a little bit about the basic functions of the immune system. It's got four basic functions. The first is protection. The immune system really is our first line at protecting our bodies from foreign invaders. And what that means is parasites, bacteria, viruses, all of these that could potentially cause serious illness in our bodies, the immune system is our first line of defense. It is also constantly surveilling. Was that a foreign invader? Was that something that's gonna be harmful to us? It's constantly on the lookout for things that could potentially harm us. When it does find something that could potentially harm us, its job is to recognize that, yes, this is a bacteria or a parasite or a virus that does not belong in the body and can do us harm. And then its last job is to respond, right? Like what good is protecting and surveilling and recognition if you don't have an adequate response system? So these four cells are the cells of the immune system that respond to infection. Neutrophils and macrophages are cells that actually kill and eat bacteria, parasites, and viruses. And anything that survives that initial line of defense is then dealt with by lymphocytes, which are T cells and B cells. T cells are actually really neat because they not only kill infection, but they activate the B cells to make antibodies to against that specific invader. And so the body will remember the next time this particular bacteria or parasite or virus tries to infect the body, those B cells will make the antibodies that remember, oh yes, this is an infection and this is how I can most effectively and efficiently get rid of the infection. So the T cells are quite remarkable. But if you can remember, I just told you that during pregnancy, T cells are suppressed. So you might be thinking, what is the point? Like, why would evolution do this? Reproduction is the key to the survival of our species. Why would we make pregnant patients more susceptible to bacteria and viruses and parasites uh, by decreasing the immune response? And so the way I like to think about it is that pregnancy doesn't actually suppress the immune system, but rather it modulates it. And this is particularly key in the uterus. So there are T cells in the uterus. But what else is growing in the uterus at the time of pregnancy? A fetus, right? And the fetus could actually be recognized as a foreign body. And so those T cells in the uterus become suppressed so that the fetus can grow without being recognized as a foreign body. Um, and while this is all happening, pregnancy also makes the immune system better at detecting antigens. And so those antibodies that are already circulating through the body are more able to detect any potential invaders that they've seen before. Unfortunately, viral infections during pregnancy are quite common. Ask any pregnant patient who's ever had a cold how that felt, and they'll tell you the cold lasted forever and it was like the worst cold of their life. So viral infections are pretty common and they can be severe. Even the common cold can feel pretty terrible to a pregnant patient. 
Luckily, placenta, the placenta is a really, really good regulator of traffic. So that two-way street, the placenta is like the best traffic guard that you've ever seen. It's really, really good at preventing viruses and parasites and bacteria from crossing over and impacting the fetus. So luckily, most viruses do not infect the fetus. However, we can all think of a couple of viruses that do cross over the placenta and infect the fetus. Most, um, I think most dramatically, uh, and the one that was most in the news most recently was Zika virus. If you all remember, I feel like now coronavirus has overshadowed every single other virus, but Zika was actually a huge concern for me as an OBGYN because we were getting reports out of Brazil initially about patients who had had this Zika virus and they themselves had a very mild course, but then they were giving birth to babies who were being impacted by very severe microcephaly. So small heads, small brains, and pretty severe birth defects. And so as an OBGYN, uh, I was really attuned to Zika, but there are other viruses as well that cross the placenta, such as herpes and syphilis, German measles. These are quite uncommon, so much so that actually in my entire 10 year career, I've only ever seen one case of uh, herpes that's crossed the placenta and no other viruses. So these are uncommon. So the good news is that most viruses don't are not able to cross the placenta. So with that brief background about the physiology of pregnancy, I'm going to talk to you about SARS-CoV-2, which I think has really changed our world and, and changed the way we see everything. Uh, this is a picture of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. SARS-CoV-2 is actually a coronavirus, which are very common. That common cold that I was talking about, that's a coronavirus. The problem with SARS-CoV-2 is that this is a novel coronavirus. And what that means is that no human prior to, I don't know, the last week of December in 2019 had ever been exposed to this particular coronavirus. And why that's important is that it meant that nobody had natural immunity. So those T cells and B cells that are working to produce our uh, antibodies, those just had never been exposed to this virus. So nobody had any antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, which is part of the reason it was able to spread essentially like wildfire. SARS-CoV-2 was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization on March 11th, 2020, which it's hard to believe was over a year ago. Uh, we now know that, of course, it's spread by close contact. It's a respiratory infection, so it's spread through respiratory droplets, which are passed in close contact when you cough or sneeze or sing or talk loudly or really do any of the things that humans do when they're together. Uh, so I wanted to compare and give you all an idea of SARS-CoV-2 when compared with SARS, which is also a coronavirus that impacted about, infected about 8,000 or so people um, in 2003 the pandemic influenza of 1918, and then the pandemic influenza H1N1 in, that occurred in 2009. So let's take a look at the transmissibility. And what this means is how infectious is SARS-CoV-2 when compared to these other three viruses? And the transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2 is 2.5, which is higher than all three of the other viruses, meaning that this virus is extremely, extremely infectious. The incubation period is another uh, thing I want to explain to you all. The incubation period for SARS-CoV-2 is about four to 12 days, which is longer than all of the other viruses. What does this actually mean? It means that somebody can be well and can be feeling completely fine, but actually be infected with the virus, be walking around spreading the virus and not know it because they don't feel badly, they feel fine. And so the incubation period being so long has a really big disadvantage because you have people who are well, who are going around and spreading the virus before they become ill. Uh, the proportion with mild illness for SARS-CoV-2 is pretty high, meaning that most people do just fine. Most people who are infected have a mild illness, they don't feel very ill, and they do just fine. The problem is that 20% of patients who are infected with SARS-CoV-2 and develop COVID-19 need to be hospitalized. Now you may be looking at this chart and saying, well, in SARS, 70% uh, had to be hospitalized. And so this is not that bad. The problem is that the total number of, in, of cases of SARS was about 8,000 or so. And the total number of cases of SARS-CoV-2 is in the millions. And so if even a few 20% of those patients require hospitalization, we've got a problem, right? Because hospitals have a finite number of beds. And out of those few who end up getting hospitalized, there's a smaller proportion who require intensive care unit admission, but if you can see the pandemic influenza of 2009, H1N1, and if you compare the two, 
those patients who have COVID-19 have a five to six times higher rate of requiring intensive care admission than those patients with H1N1 in the pandemic influenza in 2009. Uh, and in our hospital, we have a finite number of ICU beds. And so we ended up actually having, when all of our ICU beds were full, we actually ended up having to close down the preoperative and postoperative units in the hospital. So where patients go prior to surgery and where they come back once they've had surgery, we had to close those and convert those into makeshift ICUs to accommodate this huge influx of patients, particularly during the first surge, although it happened with the second surge as well. So as you can imagine, this is a huge burden for hospitals. So even having a small number of patients who require admission to the hospital and a small number of patients who require intensive care, when you're talking about you know, patients in the hundreds of thousands, that's a lot of people. Luckily, most people who do end up uh, getting infected with SARS-CoV-2 have mild illness, especially if you're a young patient, you tend to do just fine. The problem is that this virus wreaks havoc on people who are older. So we found that patients who are 60 and above tend to get very ill with this virus. So they have severe disease and they also have increased rates of death when compared to younger patients. This is now outdated, but it was, I think, a really clear chart to show the historical comparison between the 2009 influenza pandemic and other pandemics that have happened with influenza, SARS and MERS. So if you can see SARS was very deadly, but the number, total number of deaths was very small. The same thing with MERS, very deadly, but total number of deaths was small. This is outdated, but as of today in the US, there have been 550,000 deaths from COVID-19. Globally, we're talking about 2.78 million deaths. And if you look at the 1918 influenza pandemic, I mean, we even if you say, okay, it was 1918, they didn't have a great public health structure. How are they counting all these numbers? Maybe this number of 1.2 million deaths globally is not accurate. I still think that it's not gonna to compare to the 2.78 million deaths and the pandemic is not even over. So I think that the deaths cannot be discounted. The other issue that I wanted to talk about is that in this country, there are specific groups that are particularly vulnerable to COVID-19 and those groups are defined by race and ethnicity. So when compared to uh, white communities, uh, communities of color have been severely impacted by COVID-19. In particular, uh, Native American or American Indian, Alaskan Native, and Black communities, as well as Hispanic communities, have been impacted by higher numbers of cases within their communities, higher rates of hospitalization, and higher rates of death when compared to white communities. And I think we have to think about this in light of the systemic racism that exists in this country. Um, and really this pandemic has highlighted the inequities that exist. And so these communities being more affected by COVID-19 is not random, it's as a result of the systemic inequalities that exist. These are communities that historically have had poor access to healthcare. They, these patients may live in what we call food deserts in communities where there's no supermarket, there's no farmer's market, there's no way for them to get any healthy food. And, we, and so there's higher rates of obesity and diabetes at baseline. And we know that two of the risk factors that lead to severe infection and death in patients who have COVID-19 are obesity and diabetes. And so these are communities that already are disadvantaged. And now this pandemic is really just highlighting the inequities that exist. So now let's pivot and talk a little bit about SARS-CoV-2 and how it impacts pregnancy in particular. And before we talk about SARS-CoV-2, I wanted to highlight racial disparities in maternal deaths because this information will also be important when we're talking about COVID-19 and pregnancy. So maternal mortality is defined as the number of pregnant patients who died during pregnancy, childbirth, or in that first year after giving birth. And it's the bottom number, the denominator is 100,000. So we talk about it as a rate per 100,000 women giving birth. The US, despite being a high income country, has the highest rates of maternal mortality compared to all other high income countries. And to give you two examples, our maternal mortality rate is 18, almost 18 per 100,000. And that is closer to the maternal mortality rate of a country like Latvia, which has a maternal mortality rate of 19 per 100,000 then compared to Italy, which has a maternal mortality rate of two per 100,000. Now the maternal mortality rate will never be zero. I think we have a, you know, it's a fallacy to think that pregnancy and delivery will always be safe. There will always be dangers. 
And so I think to achieve a maternal mortality rate of zero is probably not possible, but we can certainly do better than what we are doing now, which is unacceptably high, particularly because as a high income country, we have a lot of resources that I'm sure Latvia does not. When we look by race, it is no surprise, unfortunately, that maternal mortality also has been affected by racial disparities, with Black women having the highest rates of maternal mortality compared to any other group. And so people might say, well, this might be because of socioeconomic status, but actually it's not. Studies have been controlling for socioeconomic status and um, educational status, and they've shown that a Black woman with a college degree is five times more likely to die in childbirth than a white woman with a college degree. So clearly there is something else going on here besides socioeconomic status. We cannot blame poverty for these rates that we are seeing. And I think you know, one of the things that we must be aware of is how our medical system treats patients of color and how patients of color are um, viewed within this medical system and how this contributes to death. And so I think, again, the systemic inequalities and the systemic racism that we've seen uh, highlighted by the pandemic has been apparent in our maternal mortality rates for many years. So let's actually now talk with that in mind, I want you to, to I'm gonna to talk to you about SARS-CoV-2 and pregnancy. So the CDC actually did this huge study studying th over 30,000 pregnant women who had COVID-19. And they found that the most common symptoms were pretty straightforward, fever, cough, muscle aches, headache. 28% of patients developed a pneumonia related to COVID-19 and 25% of pregnant patients experienced symptoms for more than two months afterwards. So those COVID long callers that we're just starting to get more data on, 25% of pregnant patients would fall into that category. What the CDC also found, uh, and surprisingly, was that there was an increased mortality and morbidity for pregnant patients. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we actually did not know this until we had further data, but pregnant patients who have COVID-19 had higher rates of requiring intensive care unit admission, they had higher rates of invasive ventilation, and they had higher rates of dying if they were infected with COVID-19 compared to women their same age who were not pregnant. So pretty sobering statistics for our pregnant patients. I wanted to give you another historical example and compare this with SARS and MERS. So patients who were pregnant who had SARS and MERS when compared to patients who were pregnant and had COVID-19. So the intensive care unit emissions for SARS and MERS were much, much higher than for COVID-19. And the overall fatality rates in pregnancy were much higher as well. The good news is that while SARS and MERS were um, had high mortality and morbidity rates, very few pregnant patients actually developed SARS and MERS compared to COVID-19, right? Like I think if you remember about 8,000 people total have gotten SARS and for MERS, I think the number is slightly over 2,500. Compare that with COVID-19, where in the US alone, 30,000 women have gotten COVID-19 who are pregnant. So the numbers are just vastly different. So even though this ICU admission rate seems small, when we're talking about larger baseline populations, we're talking about more pregnant women needing to be admitted to the ICU. And of course, I sort of primed you because I talked to you about the maternal mortality rates and the racial disparities. Unfortunately, COVID-19 does not, add, it follows that same pattern of discriminating by race. So patients who are pregnant and who are Hispanic or Black had higher rates of ICU admission, which is the blue bar here, and higher rates of requiring mechanical ventilation, the purple bars here, and higher rates of death the yellow bars when compared with white patients. So really significant, significant disparities, particularly in the, in the Hispanic community um, for patients who are pregnant. And so just very sobering statistics. And again, I cannot emphasize this enough, how the systemic inequalities uh, play a huge role in this. In addition to race, there are other risk factors for severe disease, age greater than 39, body mass index greater than 30, having high blood pressure or hypertension, having asthma, having diabetes, and having preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is a disease that affects pregnant women. Uh, it involves having, uh, pregnant women having high blood pressure, but also the high blood pressure changes their liver and kidney functions so that their liver and kidney don't function as well. In severe cases, you can develop, uh, pregnant patients can develop actually seizures because their blood pressure gets so high or stroke. And in really severe cases, patients can die. So this is something not to be trifled with. So in addition to the uh, rates of intensive care unit emission, mechanical ventilation, and death, there are actually other risks during pregnancy for women who have COVID-19. Preeclampsia, which I talked about just now, 
is a risk that happens to patients with COVID-19 independent of their baseline risk for preeclampsia. And so 16% of patients with COVID-19 actually went on to develop preeclampsia. Intrauterine growth restriction, meaning babies who are smaller and don't grow to their full potential, also was impacted in patients with COVID-19. And those patients had a 12% chance of having a baby impacted by growth restriction if they'd had COVID-19 during pregnancy. And so because of this reason, we're actually recommending that any patient who has COVID-19 gets monthly ultrasounds to make sure that the baby is growing well. There are other adverse fetal effects during pregnancy for these patients who have COVID-19. Preterm birth is one, so delivering before your due date a low birth weight, so similar to having growth restriction, but not as severely impacted, and C-section, with one study demonstrating that 90% of patients delivered by C-section rather than vaginally. There's also increased risks of stillbirth and neonatal deaths. I think these first three risks, preterm birth weight, a preterm birth, low birth weight, and C-section are actually what we call iatrogenic, meaning that physicians caused them. And I think part of the reason is that you know, if patients are very ill with COVID-19 and they're pregnant, we know that their physiology during pregnancy is preventing them from maybe clearing the disease faster, or maybe, you know, their decreased lung capacity is being impacted by the virus and by their pregnancy. And so we may recommend to them, you know, we should probably just deliver you, even though you're not near your due date and you're not full term, we think that you're sick enough that we should deliver you now so that you don't develop further complications. And the fastest way, unfortunately, to deliver a baby is by C-section. So these three, the first three effects may be caused by physicians rather than by the disease itself. The big question and the question that I had many, many patients ask me is, does SARS-CoV-2 cross the placenta? If I get COVID-19, will I pass it along to my baby? So in the beginning of the pandemic, we really didn't know. And luckily, there's been more data. But first, I wanted to talk to you about the three modes of vertical transmission. Vertical transmission is defined as when mom passes an infection to baby. And there's three ways this can happen. One is gestation, so pregnancy. During pregnancy, if the placenta is not you know, functioning as well and it allows that virus or parasite or bacteria to cross over the placenta and infect the baby. The second uh, opportunity for vertical transmission is at the time of delivery, whether that's vaginal delivery or C-section. And the third opportunity for a virus or bacteria to get transmitted from mom to baby is through breastfeeding. Um, HIV is actually unfortunately quite efficient at being at vertical at being vertically transmitted, and it can cross the placenta. It can um, cross and infect the baby during the time of delivery, and it's also actually present in breast milk. And so, which is why we tell our HIV positive patients that they must have a C-section prior to their due date, and they should not breastfeed to minimize the chances of HIV passing vertically. Um, one more thing I wanted to tell you is that for the mode of vertical transmission to be confirmed. So for, for us to say that, for example, SARS-CoV-2 is indeed vertically transmitted, meaning it's passed from mom to baby through one of these mechanisms, there have to be a couple of things that we see. The first is that the virus has to be present in the baby's umbilical cord blood. The second is that the virus has to be present in the amniotic fluid before the bag of water was broken. And the third is that it has to be present in the neonatal blood, so in the newborn, within 12 hours of delivery. So basically you take blood from the newborn and confirm that the, the virus was in the blood and it has to be you know, within 12 hours of delivery. And so those three conditions have to be uh, confirmed for us to say, yes, SARS-CoV-2 is, is transmitted vertically. So luckily there's a lot more studies being done now to show does this actually happen. So my colleagues who um, from our hospital actually looked to see, can you transmit the virus during gestation? So does it cross the placenta? They studied about 64 pregnant patients with COVID-19 and found that 36% had no symptoms, 34% had very mild symptoms, 27% had moderate or severe disease and 3% had critical disease, meaning they were admitted in the intensive care unit. Most of these patients were diagnosed in the third trimester. And interestingly, they found no evidence of the virus in either mom's blood or the uh, umbilical cord blood. So the blood taken from the umbilical cord after delivery. And there was no evidence of SARS-CoV-2 in the placentas of these patients. And so, and none of the newborns, so 77 newborns born to 64 mothers, so some twins, um, none of the newborns had SARS-CoV-2. So this study concluded that there was no evidence of vertical transmission um, that we could prove from, from uh, 
from being pregnant. There was one patient, one newborn who had cord blood with antibodies, but the neonate, the newborn tested negative for SARS-CoV-2. So they felt like this was not truly an infection and their um, theory that there was no evidence of vertical transmission, they felt like they could still stand by that. How about during the time of delivery? Can SARS-CoV-2 be transmitted through a vaginal delivery or a C-section? So this is a meta-analysis of 49 studies. So they put together 49 studies from all over the world that studied 666 newborns born to 655 mothers who had SARS-CoV-2. The vaginal delivery rate, uh, the vaginal delivery, 3% of babies born vaginally were positive. 5% of babies born via cesarean section were positive for SARS-CoV-2. And so this, a meta-analysis concluded that the incidence of infection was not impacted by the mode of delivery because there was no substantial difference between babies who were born vaginally or babies who were born via C-section and their risk of uh, being infected with SARS-CoV-2. The study also found that there was no evidence that breastfeeding transmitted the virus or that rooming in, meaning that um, the baby is kept in the same room as mom, uh, transmitted the virus. And out of those small percentage of newborns who did test positive for SARS-CoV-2, none actually had severe disease and none of the newborns required intensive care unit admission, none of them required ventilation. And so the study concluded that vertical transmission could not be confirmed at the time of delivery. And the thought was maybe these tests are so sensitive that they're detecting virus that might not actually be uh, significant enough to cause severe infection. And finally, two studies looked at whether the virus could be transmitted during breastfeeding. One study found no evidence of virus in any breast milk sample. Another study found that only three samples of breast milk actually had detectable levels of SARS-CoV-2 virus, but that they were unsure whether this was in high enough levels to cause an active infection in, in a baby. And what they also found was that women who'd had COVID-19 in pregnancy passed along small amounts of antibodies in their breast milk. And so the investigators wondered if there could be possibly be a protective effect of breastfeeding. So for those women who had COVID-19 in pregnancy, could they pass along protective antibodies to their babies through breastfeeding? And so the conclusion that I've sort of come to when looking at all of these studies is that there's not great evidence for vertical transmission of SARS-CoV-2. And the neonates who were infected with SARS-CoV-2, you know, the infection rates are very low, and they're almost never symptomatic. They never had symptoms, they never had severe disease, they were discharged home with their moms, no problem. And so the conclusion that, and this is what I tell my patients, is that the risk of vertical transmission, so you know, mom passing the virus to baby is less than 1%, which is great news. So I'll now switch and talk not just about the physical effects of COVID-19 in pregnancy, but the psychosocial effects of COVID-19 and giving birth in a pandemic. I think this headline from you know, 10 days ago really says it all, anxiety, confusion, terror, and relief. And as an OBGYN, uh, I had so many patients, particularly in that first surge when we didn't know how the virus was transmitted, what would prevent transmission, if this impacted pregnant women in a different way, if this impacted babies, you know, patients were extremely anxious, extremely anxious. And I think we can all have empathy and understand why, right? Like these are women who are, who have no idea how this virus is transmitted, who just really want to keep themselves and their babies safe. And as a medical professional, I had very little advice in those first few weeks of the pandemic, aside from just wash your hands, because at that point, the mask mandates weren't even in effect. And I wasn't wearing a mask in clinic, and neither were my patients. Now, thankfully, that's changed and everybody's wearing masks. But I think especially at the beginning, there was such anxiety about what to expect. And for my patients in particular, in a research study um, outlined these anxieties really beautifully, for those patients who had COVID-19, they were really worried because they were worried, well, what if this is passed to my baby? Will the baby have structural anomalies or birth defects? Will the baby not grow as well? Will I have a preterm birth? Will I give birth early because I have COVID-19? Luckily, there's been no evidence that COVID-19 causes birth defects, but we've certainly seen, you know, there is a 12% chance that these babies having growth restriction and, um, we as physicians are often delivering patients who have COVID-19 early before their due date because we don't want them to get sicker. So in many ways, these patients' anxieties were well-founded. What also complicated the picture further was that medical guidelines were sort of all over the place, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. For example, the World Health Organization and UNICEF had very different recommendations than the CDC. So the WHO said, 
of course, women who have COVID-19, they should breastfeed, they should room in, meaning keep their babies in the same room, and that's to help with bonding. They should do skin to skin, which basically means uh, mom placing the baby directly on her chest that serves two purposes, and that happens immediately after delivery. It serves two purposes. One is that the babies have been nice and warm inside of the uterus and inside of their amniotic sac, then they deliver and the outside world is much colder than where they were. And so their temperature regulation, it's not great. And so their temperatures plummet. So one way that you can prevent that decrease is by holding the baby directly on your skin, giving your body warmth to the baby. And the second benefit of skin to skin is that babies who do skin to skin for at least the first hour after being born have higher breastfeeding rates and they tend to be better at latching on and, and moms tend to do better with breastfeeding. And so the WHO was saying, yes, we should breastfeed and you should room in and keep your baby in the same room and you should do skin to skin. And then the CDC was saying, well, maybe it's okay to breastfeed, but you should really consider pumping and then giving that bottle to somebody else so that they can feed the baby because we don't want you to touch your baby. And you should separate the newborn and, and the mom who has COVID-19 so the newborn doesn't get sick. Uh, and you should not do skin to skin. So really dramatically different recommendations. And in some hospitals, not luckily, not in ours, because we always encourage women to breastfeed even if they had COVID-19. And we encourage women to keep their babies in their room and we encourage them to do skin to skin. So basically we, in our hospital, we were following the WHO recommendations, but in some hospitals in New York, for example, women were separated from their newborns if they had COVID-19. So really devastating for a new mom who can't even hold or see her baby that she just gave birth to because she's COVID-19. And so of course, patients weren't reassured, you know, when they read the news or heard from their friends, well, my friend in New York said she was separated from her baby if that was gonna happen to me. And I had to say, no, but you know, guidelines are changing and that might change. So not very reassuring for patients. And then giving birth during a pandemic is really challenging because for example, typically a patient will come to see me who's pregnant, a patient will come to see me every month. And then as we get closer to the due date, they come every two weeks. And then a couple of weeks before the due date, they start coming every week. Well, guess what? Because of the pandemic, we had to shut down our clinics and I was doing one day of telehealth and one day of in-person visits. And so patients had fewer prenatal visits. Yes, they could talk to me on the phone or via video, but they weren't coming in to see me. And I had to do a lot of telehealth, which was new for the patients and new for me. In clinic, previously we used to allow patients to bring whoever they wanted to clinic, bring you know, your mom, your best friend, your partner, whoever you want. And now in clinic, we were saying, actually, you're not allowed to bring anybody. So you have to come to your visit alone. Um, and patients were finding that really challenging, especially if I had to give them bad news on labor and delivery. Uh, we luckily, our hospital always allowed one support person on labor and delivery, even during the height of the pandemic. But in New York, for example, and I apologize for New Yorkers out there, I'm a native New Yorker as well, but I think, you know, their policies were dramatically different and very publicized. And so uh, I keep referring to them, but of course, I'm sure other places did this as well. But they, the hospitals in New York, because of their high infection rates, didn't actually allow women to bring anybody with them to the hospital when they were ready to give birth. So women were giving birth alone. Now, if you think about it, you know, pregnancy and, the, and delivery, it's a time of joy. You're building your family. And so many patients want their moms and their partners to be there and, and then their best friends to be there. And now we were asking them, well, maybe you could bring one person, but really no more than that. Forget doulas. Nobody could bring a doula. And so a lot of my patients were actually FaceTiming their doulas as a way of getting around this. After giving birth, typically we had an unrestricted visitor policy prior to the pandemic. Now with the pandemic, even our hospital was saying, actually, you're not allowed to have any visitors. And so women would give birth with one support person who wasn't allowed to leave the hospital and they would have no visitors. And then we were telling them, okay, you're doing fine, ready to go home. And we would discharge our patients who had a vaginal delivery the very next day and discharge our patients who had a C-section after two days. And typically, Women who've had a vaginal delivery stay in the hospital for two nights and women who've had a C-section stay in the hospital for four nights. And now we were like literally encouraging them to leave. And to be honest, many patients wanted to leave because they were worried about getting COVID-19 in the hospital. They were worried about their baby getting COVID-19. Nobody wanted to use the nursery. People were just worried. And so, and they couldn't have visitors. So they just opted to leave early. But if you can imagine that leaves women at their most vulnerable, right? Like I'm an OBGYN. I talk to, to women every day about pregnancy and what's going to happen after delivery. And I can tell you, I have two kids. When I had my first, I was like a deer in headlights. I was like, wait, you're just sending me home? There's no instruction manual? I mean, an iPhone came with an instruction manual and you're sending me home with a baby. And nobody told me what to do. I didn't know how to change a diaper because, I mean, my job is really 
I birthed the baby, then I hand the baby off. And so I didn't know how to change a diaper. I didn't know how to do anything. And it was terrifying to go home. But the one thing that kept me going was that my mom was going to be there and she was going to help me. Right. And now we were telling women, you must leave early and nobody's going to be at home to help you because everybody's in lockdown. So I can't even imagine what it must have been like for these poor patients. And even for patients who weren't pregnant, there is these like invisible harms of the pandemic. And what I mean by that is things that nobody really can see or talk about. But for example, that lack of social support, right? So we're sending new moms out into the community. Typically there's new mom groups. You hang out with your fellow mom friends, you commiserate. I remember when I um, had my son, I, my husband was doing interviews for jobs. And so he had to leave. Uh, and I was petrified because I was like, oh my gosh, how do I take a shower? What if the baby cries? Who's gonna help the baby? And so my best friend came over to watch my son so that I could take a shower because I was that terrified of leaving him alone. Second child, I didn't care. But you know, with the first child, you're just terrified. And I can't imagine how you would do that if you had no social support, if like your best friend couldn't come to watch your baby for an hour or two while you took a shower and got something to eat and took a nap. And so that those fabrics that people relied on to help with childcare, for example, you know, what if grandparents are, have been watching your kids and now you can't see the grandparents because if you have COVID-19 and you give it to them, they could possibly die. So I think all those things contributed to these invisible harms of the pandemic. And of course, the isolation has been real for everybody, right? It's impacted children to adults and it's been pretty severe for everyone. But I think particularly for, for women who relied on these community structures to help them get through delivery, to help them get through the first couple of weeks of a baby's life, it's been very challenging. Childcare disruptions, massive, huge, right? Uh, our, for example, our daycare closed with uh, 12 hours notice for five months. It's not my daycare's fault. They had no idea that this was gonna happen, but it's a small daycare in a small town and we didn't have advance notice. Um, and my husband's infectious disease and I'm an OBGYN and both of our jobs are essential. And so I called up one of my good friends um, and said, I need you to watch the kids tomorrow because we don't have daycare. And I dropped her, my kids off at her place and she watched them for the day. And then I was lucky enough that we were able to have a sitter. And I, you know, that's my privilege. I'm able to do that. There are plenty of other women who could not afford childcare. Um, maybe their parents have been taking care of their children and now that's no longer a possibility. And this leads to the other invisible harm, which is job losses. In April of 2020, so right at the beginning of that surge, 50% uh, of women, 55% of women lost their jobs, right? Or excuse me, 55% of the jobs that were lost in April of 2020 were held by women. And that's not huge, but it's significant. And then in September of 2020, nearly 900,000 women um, quit their jobs or lost their jobs. And that was at a rate four times that of men. What happens in every September? School starts, right? Except this September, there was no school. My kids were, my three-year-old was not in school and my six-year-old was doing remote kindergarten. And lucky, luckily I had a sitter, but there are plenty of women who didn't have that privilege, right? There are plenty of women who couldn't find a sitter, who couldn't hire somebody. And so those women ended up quitting their jobs and doing homeschooling with their kids. And that job loss is gonna be felt for years to come. And the last piece is the increased rates of domestic violence that we've seen during the pandemic. And all three of these pieces build into or factor into the increased rates of domestic violence. Women who were previously independent and had their own job and were financially independent and financially secure lost their jobs. And now we're relying completely on this person who felt like he or she could domestically abuse them. Lack of social support. Previously, they may have been able to confide in a friend or may have been able to go live with a friend. They can't do that right now. Childcare. They're now stuck at home. They're not going anywhere. They don't have any childcare. They have no interactions with the medical system because you know, we're all doing telehealth. And so the opportunities to seek help are really limited for patients who are suffering from domestic violence. So these are just some of the ways that the pandemic has harmed us, not just physically, but mentally as well. And of course, it's no surprise that there's been increased rates of depression and anxiety. And I wanna preface this by saying that in general, there's been an increased rate of depression and anxiety during the pandemic. And so for typically the general population in the US has a 13% rate of depression and a 14% rate of anxiety. Among pregnant patients, it's pretty equivalent ranging from 7.4 to 12.8% risk, you know, rates of depression among the pregnant patients and 15.2% rate of anxiety uh, in pregnant patients. 
Then the pandemic hit. And of course, everybody's anxiety and depression increased, right? So when the pandemic hit, almost 20% of patients reported depression and 22% of the general population reported anxiety. But for pregnant patients, this is far, far worse. Um, the rates of depression were nearly three times higher for pregnant patients um, and similarly with anxiety. So lots of anxiety, lots of depression among our pregnant patients at rates we had never seen before. So it's been a very bleak talk so far. I've talked a lot about how the unique physiology of pregnancy predisposes women to getting very ill with COVID-19, the higher rates of requiring intensive care unit admission, the higher rates of requiring ventilation and higher rates of death, particularly in our communities of color. Um, so I feel like I've been very bleak, but there is hope and it's coming in the form of vaccinations. The vaccines are safe, and I want to emphasize that, that all the vaccines that are currently FDA approved in the US are safe. The issue is that, of course, each vaccine is, is unique, right? And the mode, the method used to create these vaccinations using M messenger RNA has actually never been done in a vaccine before. But messenger RNA has been used in other drugs and in medical technology for years before, just never for vaccines. The clinical trials are meant to pick up common complications. But the problem is that, of course, there's always that rare complication that's going to occur that you won't find out about until after millions of doses have been given. And so I really want to reassure my patients that the vaccine is safe and the common complications are you know, very unlikely and rare complications are very, very unlikely um, and will probably never happen to my individual patient. And it's interesting because in the United Kingdom, uh, pregnant women initially were not being offered the vaccine. And our professional organizations, the American College of OBGYNs and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, actually, and I'm very proud that they did this, came out with a committee opinion saying, we recommend that pregnant women be offered the vaccine when they are eligible. And so I've had a lot of discussions with my pregnant patients. And I've talked very frankly about the fact that unfortunately, no pregnant patients or, and no breastfeeding patients were included in these vaccine trials for any of the vaccines. And this is not something new, actually. This is a historic precedent. So historically, few pregnant or breastfeeding women have been included in drug trials or vaccine trials. And there's a historic reason behind this. So every trial dealing with a drug or a new vaccine needs to go through an institutional review board in order to be approved. And the Institutional Review Board is made up of a committee of scientists and physicians and epidemiologists, and they look at the ethics of the trial and they seek to determine whether the risks, whether the benefits of that potential medication or vaccine outweigh the risks, because the last thing that they want is to approve a trial that's going to end up causing severe harm to the patients that are enrolled in the trial. The problem is that this process, as you can imagine, is very lengthy and pregnant women are classified as a vulnerable patient population. Another example of patients who are classified as a vulnerable patient population is prisoners and children. And so the Institutional Review Board, I think, was trying to protect and safeguard pregnant patients, but actually ended up doing the opposite because it prevented them from being included in vaccine and drug trials because people who, you know, the scientists who were creating these things were like, oh gosh, who's gonna go through all this bureaucracy and red tape to include pregnant women in our trial, we're just not gonna include them. And so this historic precedent has led to an exclusion of pregnant women and breastfeeding women from drug and vaccine trials, to much to the detriment of the patients themselves. And so I have said to my patients very frankly that, you know, although none of the vaccine trials unfortunately included pregnant women, there were women included in the trials who inadvertently got pregnant and nothing bad happened to them and nothing bad happened to their fetus. Um, and then in animal models, the studies have shown there's been no impact on pregnant animals. I think pregnant rats and mice who got the vaccine, no impact on their fetuses, no evidence of malformations. Uh, I know there's this theory going around that the vaccines impact fertility, but that's actually not true either because women who were enrolled in the vaccine trials ended up getting pregnant. So clearly it didn't, even when they weren't trying, so clearly this did not impact fertility.
And the best news to come out of all this, this is quite recent, and a colleague of mine actually did this study, was that she studied pregnant women who had completed the vaccine and who were fully vaccinated and looked at um, breast milk samples and found that mothers actually passed COVID antibodies through the breast milk to their babies, which is wonderful. And they found that those antibody levels were higher in women who'd been vaccinated than in women who'd had COVID-19. So really hopeful news and very, very encouraging to our pregnant patients who may be wondering when to get the vaccine. So I've now been telling my patients, you know, there's great data out there showing that you will develop antibodies that will pass to your baby and antibodies do cross the placenta. So that's how some of the babies ended up getting that, you know, protection even without being breastfed. So the antibodies will cross the placenta and will be present in the baby and will give the baby some protection. And if you bre choose to breastfeed, your breast milk will also pass along those antibodies that you have made while you were getting vaccinated. So really this is wonderful news and very hopeful to our patients. Uh, this was sort of a whirlwind tour, so I apologize and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll stop sharing um, just so that we can have a moment to have questions. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. And, you know, I'm, I'm very impressed because you did such a great job of explaining first the, the introductory physiology, but then all of the pieces and fitting them together. So to be honest, as you were going through, I was noting down the questions that students had asked that you already answered in your lecture. So thank you so much for that. That's, it's really wonderful. It was a great lecture. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. Um, so I also want to thank you for discussing the, the racial health disparities. That's something that we've talked about in this class um, in other lectures as well. Uh, and I think it's it's something that's a huge concern for students. So I'm actually going to ask you a non-COVID related question first, just to get your opinion, because many students had it. And we have a lot of pre-med students um, in this class and in our program. So do you have any advice for what people can do, particularly trainees who are trying to go into medicine to try and improve that situation of, you know, racial health disparities generally, but then also the figures that you showed um, when it comes to maternal health um, and the racial disparities associated with that. Do you have any advice about what would most effectively try and counter those issues? That is a wonderful question. And I think it's the response is going to be multifaceted. I think first and foremost, we who are interested in the medical profession or who are in the medical profession need to be aware of these statistics and we need to talk about them because nothing is going to change if we pretend like everything is okay and there's no impact, there's no you know, disparities in the maternal mortality rate. So I think the first step is really acknowledging and understanding why. And I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, When I was in training, I was historically taught, oh yes, black women have higher rates of preeclampsia. And nobody ever challenged me to think why. Nobody ever explains like, why do you think that is? And it's really interesting because now newer data is showing that black women face um, as do many other non-white groups in this country face like daily microaggressions, daily incidences of bias, and that over time, this builds up in their body and manifests physically as increased rates of high blood pressure and increased, you know, like inflammatory response. So of course, they're going to have preeclampsia when they have pregnancy, you know, because like their body has been incredibly stressed for the two, three decades of their life. And now pregnancy is an additional physical stress placed on a woman. And so I think learning about these inequities and also talking about it with our patients. What I have in my practice, I am very, very lucky. I have a really diverse patient uh, practice and I love that. And it's one of the reasons that I love my job. But you know, my patients who are black and, and Hispanic are really worried about their increased risks of dying in childbirth. And I think for me as an OBGYN, my goal is really to ensure that they have a safe delivery, but it's heartbreaking when people say, I'm really worried I'm gonna die in childbirth. Uh, and that's something that's very, very hard for me as an OBGYN to hear, because it's not like we live in the middle of nowhere, like this is Boston, we shouldn't have any maternal deaths. And so I um, try to educate my patients about what they can do. I encourage my patients to have a doula because doulas have been shown to increase vaginal delivery rates. It's also a third person who can advocate for you and who may have more familiarity with the medical system. So I think having frank conversations with our patients, asking our patients, do you have 
safe, healthy food options close to your house? If not, how can I help you get access to safe, healthy food options? You know, all those things. Do you feel safe in the environment in which you live in? Because if you just say, you should exercise, that will decrease your blood pressure, but the patient cannot, you know, doesn't have the means to buy a gym membership, doesn't have the means to have exercise equipment at home, and her uh, community is not safe for her to walk around in after she returns home from work in, in the dark. These are things we have to know so that we can adequately counsel our patients because people want to be healthy. They don't not want to be healthy. And I think understanding our patient's perspective is so key. That's such a, a great point and excellent recommendations. Thank you. Um, so related to those anxieties, you gave some data on how much anxieties associated with pregnancy increased um, for women that were pregnant, but a lot of students were actually wondering about postpartum depression. Do you have any information about how that has changed because of the pandemic? That is a great question, and I apologize, I don't have data for that, but I am nearly 100% sure that the rates of postpartum depression have increased because so many women, again, who relied on like, you know, my mom came and lived with us for a year while I had my first baby. They can't do that anymore without, thinking like three times about the risks posed to the grandparents. Like what if they develop COVID-19 and die because of, you know, just being exposed. So I think a lot of patients, their the fabric that they relied on has really ended. And I had a patient who delivered um, in April and the grandparents just saw her newborn because the grandparents are finally vaccinated. And now that's not a newborn anymore, right? It's like a almost a year old baby. And so I think it's really heartbreaking for a lot of women who, um, relied on having family support and now no longer had that. So I'm sure that the data will show that postpartum depression rates are much higher. I think the mental health crisis rising from the pandemic is, is going to be quite significant. Absolutely. I agree. Um, so, and the information you gave us on vaccines for pregnant women also was, was wonderful and fertility, but students had some additional questions. So I want to just dive into that a little bit more. Um, obviously, pregnant women were not included in the trials, as you mentioned, but we have, as you kind of talked about, we now have a lot of pregnant women who have received the vaccine. And um, as far as I'm aware, and from what you said, but I just want to make sure, we don't have, I mean, there haven't been any reported adverse effects for pregnant women who have received the vaccine at this point. Is that correct? That is correct. Like anecdotally, in my practice, I have a lot of patients who are healthcare workers, um, and none of them had any adverse effects. Um, and I think in the data, there's no evidence of fetal anomalies or anything happening to baby or to mom. Some women did develop a fever. Um, and, you know, we, I just say, don't take it before getting the vaccine. But if you develop a fever, take Tylenol, stay hydrated, do all the things that you typically do. And the fevers would go down with Tylenol. So with treatment, the fevers would go down. So I don't think that there's any long lasting harm to the baby. That's great to hear, because that was actually one of the specific questions. Like, you know, it seems like fever seems to be the most common side effect. Mm -hmm. It's not a big deal for an average person, but obviously for a pregnant woman, it's a more serious concern. Um, so that's good to know that that seems to be treatable and then also doesn't come along with any long-term effects. Mm -hmm. So then related to the potential question on fertility, um, I guess, there obviously are a lot of reports that say there's no evidence that this, any of the vaccines cause issues with fertility, but you know, no evidence for mm -hmm. something actually really just means like it hasn't been able to be studied yet. So do you know if there is any evidence that there, I mean, you mentioned animal models um, and you also mentioned some women who have gotten pregnant after being vaccinated. Um, so a two part question, I guess, because one, one of the students was asking, like, just for more information about any data that we have that can help us know that at a large scale, there's not a concern about fertility. There were actually a lot of questions about fertility, and I think that's common in the public in general. So I feel like talking about it a little bit longer to put people's mind at ease would be good. And then the other question related to that was, if there is going to be a study to really get an idea of the long term effects, which potentially could include fertility, how long would that actually take for us to know what we may see long term, I mean, really long term from these vaccines? Yeah, great questions. I do not know how this fertility myth got propagated. But it is like, people are so anxious about it. I've had patients who are in their 20s have not had a baby and are like, yeah, I'm not getting the vaccine because I'm worried about my fertility. And I, I'm not sure where this originated from, but 
there is no vaccine that we know of yet, and vaccines have been around for decades, right, that causes infertility, that's linked to infertility. No vaccine. And so I'm not sure how we got here, but you know, the messenger RNA that's in the vaccine, it degrades within your body in 14 days, within 14 days. So there's no way that it could impact a woman's ovaries or you know, a man's sperm. There's just no way possible because it degrades so rapidly. And so this is not being incorporated into your genes. It's not impacting your ability to bear children in the future. And you know, the animal models bear that out as well as those patients who had, the, I think people actually had to sign a waiver saying they would not get pregnant for the next six months, but yet life happens. And so uh, when they were doing the vaccine trials, life happens. So women who had gotten vaccinated did end up conceiving even though they were trying not to. So I think that's all very reassuring uh, but I do think that it will probably take decades for us to firmly put this to rest. But I tell my patients, historically, if you look at every single vaccine, there is no, and there's live viruses, you know, vaccines are made in a variety of ways. There are vaccines that are used using live, you know, live viruses, and there's vaccines using inactive proteins, and none of these have ever been impacted, have ever impacted fertility. So I tell my patients, look at the historic antecedents, no evidence that any vaccines cause you to lose fertility. Um, and so that's really what I, how I try to reassure my patients. That's great. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that, that the different types of vaccines, that's another thing that I think people are getting confused yeah. because I know like for some farm animals and whatnot, there have been studies in different types of vir uh, sorry, vaccines that have led to issues, but it's not the same as what we're getting. Right. Um, so just one last question about that. Students were wondering if you have any recommendations on which of the three that are available in the United States are best to get for pregnant women. Any one that you get offered. <laughs> Literally <laughs> any shot that you can get offered, just get it. Um, and that's what, you know, that's what I followed because we weren't given a choice when we were back getting vaccinated. It was like, whatever is in the hospital, that's what you get. Um, and so that's what I'm telling everybody, just whichever vaccine. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is made the more traditional, quote unquote, way, you know, with inactive virus. And that has been extensively studied. Those creating that type of vaccine has been extensively studied in the past. So if people are really concerned, they could get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is still extremely effective at preventing um, death and severe illness from COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the cool things about Pfizer and Moderna is that it is this technology that's been studied for a long time, and as you mentioned, used in other ways. Um, and so it's great that we have this ability to, to really quickly have vaccines available that are effective and that are using technology that we know works well. Um, that's great. So to shift gears just slightly, um, you mentioned that there was an increased rate of C-sections, at least within women who had COVID, likely because you were saying doctors probably recommended that. Um, Students were wondering if given the restrictions at hospitals, if there were more at-home births or other like alternative non-hospital births. Oh my gosh, great question. Um, so I have to put it out there that as an OBGYN, I'm clearly biased against home birth. I think home birth, you know, I've studied it extensively because I did one of my projects on this, so I feel very strongly about this, but in the Netherlands and in the UK, it's been very well studied. We have to remember those populations are homogenous. They're often, in the Netherlands anyway, often healthier. Um, and the UK and the Netherlands are very small. So you can get to a hospital very fast. And they actually have protocols in place for the midwives who are trained specifically and who come to, that, come to a woman's house to help with the home birth. In the US, we do not have a system built for home births, right? Our hospitals are far. Women may be delivering in remote areas. Um, and the people, who, I actually, as an OBGYN, I will lose my license if I attend a home birth. And so you don't have trained professionals who are helping women give birth. And so I have absolutely had patients, actually I just, one of my patients just delivered last week, who was like giving me gray hair because she kept saying she did not want to come to the hospital to deliver. She had other kids at home. She was really, really worried about getting COVID in the hospital and bringing it home to her newborn and her three other kids. And I just said to her very frankly that, you know, like, yes, it's your fourth baby. And yes, your delivery will probably be fast and uncomplicated, but I still can't guarantee you that a home birth at home, bringing in somebody from the outside who may not be vaccinated is safer than delivering in a hospital where we have protocols in place 
and most of our staff has been vaccinated and everybody you know masks universally in the hospital but yes i have had multiple requests for people wanting to have a home birth um, because people are so concerned so concerned yeah you know I, it, it's interesting though because the concern about having a home birth i feel like gets amplified in a pandemic because the mm -hmm. home birth is if you do have an emergency you need to have a way to get to a hospital quickly. Absolutely. And overrun hospitals during a pandemic, you're suddenly low priority, you know, if you have to be rushed to the hospital or I don't know. It just the, the the thought of a home birth during a pandemic actually induces more anxiety in me than than, you know, dealing with the infrastructure at a hospital. But obviously nothing is ideal in a pandemic, particularly as you pointed out, all of the many ways we are social species that rely on other individuals when we're giving birth. Um, so a, a, another question about the comparison of COVID and vertical transmission related to other viruses. Students were wondering, you, you showed that it's probably incredibly rare for there to be vertical transmission. Um, how does that compare to other viruses, like for example, influenza? Oh, influenza has no vertical transmission. Okay. Yep. So influenza does not have vertical transmission. There's only a handful, luckily, only a handful of viruses that do get transmitted vertically. HIV is probably, uh, Zika and HIV are probably the two most well known. Herpes, so um, HSV 1 and 2, uh, syphilis, uh, cytomegalovirus, parvovirus, German measles, also called rubella. Um, and so those, they're really rare though, to be honest. Like we have patients who unfortunately do have sexually transmitted infections and yet rarely pass them on. So even though vertical transmission is a possibility, uh, it still remains really rare. And you know, my 10 year career, I've seen one case of vertical transmission. Um, and that was in a patient who did not know she had herpes. Uh, and it's devastating, devastating when you see it because the baby actually ended up dying shortly after being delivered. Um, and it's just horrible, but it's very rare. And I think you know, probably during uh, the worst times of HIV, probably there were more cases of vertical transmission, but now we actually have amazing protocols in place and the rates of vertical transmission, even with HIV are so low because we put everybody on antiretrovirals, which are very uh, effective at having viral loads that are low. And that's what really makes a difference. If you have high viral load, at least with HIV, you have a higher risk of vertical transmission. And then we deliver everybody very early, close to their due date, but a couple of weeks before their due date via C-section. So we're able to accommodate for that risk of vertical transmission that we know exists. But again, in my 10 years, I've seen one case of vertical transmission. That's great. And I mean, I really appreciated your introduction about the placenta because I, I study reproduction in non-human primates. And I think the placenta is just such an incredible- It's so cool. Yeah, it, the way it works is amazing. Yeah. The baby gets what it needs, but not what it doesn't need, which is exactly great. <laughs> um, wonderful. Okay, so another question is, uh, you know, I think that there was this chat early on in the pandemic that people thought there was going to be a baby boom with a lot of yeah. people having babies. And then more recently, people have said, like, actually, the opposite of that happened. Students are wondering um, if you saw an increase or decrease or it hasn't changed the amount um, or if people are talking to you about specifically waiting or not waiting because of the pandemic. That is a great question. My friends and I, who all have uh, two children, joked that there was going to be a baby boom for first children and then no other children after that. <laughs> There's somebody who had two kids at home and I've been, been thinking vaguely about like adopting a third. I was like, yeah, no more, never, never again. Um, but I think that initially we did think, oh, yeah, people are home. What else is there to do? We're going to have, we're going to see a lot of babies. But I think, you know, people were laid off. People didn't have reliable childcare. Um, I think all the people were incredibly stressed, all these things. I think people, uh, have delayed having additional children. Um, and so I think the reports out there are saying that we're going to see a decline actually in birth rates rather than the expected bump. I did have patients who talked to me about delaying fertility and maybe doing egg freezing rather than having a baby during a pandemic. So I think this is a really real fear. You know, people just heard about the horrible birth experiences and not being able to have a partner and just decided not to have baby. So I feel like I can't say that at work because I'm, I'm still really busy. So I don't know how that translates. But I do think that fewer, we're going to see a decrease in the birth rate, most likely, because it's been such a stressful time. There's economic instability. Um, and there's still a lot of unknowns out there about COVID. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Um, another question, a clarifying question about the graphs that you showed on maternal mortality and then um, the changes with COVID. So it, it looked on the, the first graph with maternal mortality, um, Black women in particular had a much higher rate. I believe that for Hispanic women, it was similar. It was not very high. It was similar to white women. Is that correct? That is correct. I can go back to that graph. Um, and then the, the question is about um, with then for Hispanic pregnant women, they had a much higher likelihood of developing complications. This was in a gap a few slides later, I think. So um, they're asking like why there is that that change? That's a great question. I think, uh, you know, the overall maternal mortality rate is much higher for Black women than it is for um, any other woman of color. But for some reason, the data from the, uh, from the CDC is showing that Hispanic women tend to have higher rates of ICU admission and higher rates of death out of all women of color. Um, again, the data is limited because, you know, they only had 30,000 women to study and the maternal mortality rate is based on hundreds of thousands of women delivering. So on the you know, hundreds of thousands of women who deliver every year. Uh, I, this is the most up-to-date data. The data in that was, I think in May of 2020 actually showed black women having the highest rate. So similar, similar trend when compared with the maternal mortality rates. But this newer data is showing that Hispanic women have higher rates. I can't explain it. I am suspicious that perhaps as more numbers come in, this may shift. So I think we're still seeing that, yes, the disparities exist. Which community they affect the most, I think, remains to be determined. Excellent. Thank you. And then a few students had questions about uh, the CDC guidelines versus the World Health Organization mm -hmm. guidelines, and in particular, how your hospital chose, I mean, I, I found that to be very shocking, exactly I mean, as an anthropologist, what you showed about not allowing skin to skin contact or having babies removed from their moms is very concerning. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's wonderful that your hospital didn't do that. A lot of students are wondering, how did you make that choice? And then also for individuals, how, sh how do they know which guidelines to follow when both of those organizations are reliable sources for information on COVID? That's a great question. And I think this comes down to advocacy for our patients, right? And I think um, I'm very fortunate. My department does a lot of advocacy. And so we advocated that the hospital actually consider us uh, separate. <laughs> And so we promised them that we would have like a separate COVID ward and, and enforce like all the protocols, but that we were not going to change our policies in this specific way. And our neonatal intensive care unit, the nursery for really sick babies, their physicians were also on board with this plan. And so we were able to show that, you know, floors nine and 10 of the hospital, we're going to do things slightly differently than the rest of the hospital. And we were very lucky. And I think this is where like your role as a physician is, is so important in advocating for your patients because we knew this was the right thing to do for our patients. Um, and you know, our neonatal intensive care unit was also very supportive. They reassured us there were zero cases in our hospital um, of you know, moms who had COVID-19 who roomed in with their babies. None of their babies had COVID-19. And I think when we presented that data, it was actually reinforced that we could sort of do whatever we wanted to do. And so we were considered a separate entity from the rest of the hospital where there were no visitors, like complete isolation for COVID patients. And so I'm very thankful that we had really good leadership who advocated for our patients. Um, and I apologize, what was the second part of your question? I think that was all of it. I mean, that, yeah, that's really wonderful. Oh, I'm sorry. There so was who, how to follow the guidelines. Yes, and I think yes. this again, where like you as a physician, um, you read the studies, you interpret the data, you talk to your smart friends. And I felt like I had a, had a secret in because my husband is infectious disease. And so he was like living, breathing this work. And I could just be like, hey, what do you think about this? And so I think just keeping up on the data and, and talking to other physicians and sort of seeing like, what do you think? And I read the UK guidelines very in a lot of detail when I was trying to counsel my patients because the UK actually came up with better guidelines than we had in the beginning of the pandemic. They sort of budged it with the vaccines. Now they re, now they reverse their position and, and are offering pregnant women the vaccine. Uh, but in general, the UK was much more humane than the US was in terms of guidelines. And so I would just compare both guidelines and I you know, looked at their numbers and they didn't have high rates of COVID-19 among newborns when they were doing this. And so that's the data I presented to my patients. But again, I think you know, it required me to read a lot and to, to do more than I think 
maybe the average physician would do. That's amazing. Your patients are very lucky to have you. You yes. are an amazing doctor. I mean, I've just met you for the first time, but you seem like a really amazing doctor. And the comments <laughs> we're getting from the students are, you know, just thanking you, saying how amazing this lecture was. And I can't say that enough. It was really incredible. We only have about a minute left. So is there anything else that you want to say to the students? There are tons of questions that I'm sorry we can't. No, I'm like a little overwhelmed with a number of questions. <laughs> yeah. But um, you my email, and I'm happy to have you reach out via email. Um, I, think just, I think we are really in the seminal moment in our nation's history. And I think all of us have a role to play in, you know, fighting against racism and inequality, both socioeconomic and, and racially based. And I think that this year in particular with COVID-19 as a medical professional alone, it's just like highlighted so much that we have such a long way to go. And I think that's the one takeaway I want people to think about that each of us can advocate for our communities. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. It was wonderful having you. To everyone else, um, we will be back on Wednesday. Until then, stay safe. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.